Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Huyen. Uh, I'm a corporate lawyer. I'm a startup lawyer, in fact, uh, based in Singapore. Uh, and today we're going to talk about five things every founder must know about preference shares. So, if you have ever raised money for your company from investors, uh, you probably would be familiar with this concept or, or this term, preference shares. Okay? Um, uh, but just before I begin, uh, a small disclaimer. As I mentioned, I'm a Singapore lawyer. The, you know, the principles of law that I discuss will be based on Singapore law. But if you are from a jurisdiction with similar legal systems, such as the UK, US, Australia, Hong Kong, and so forth, you'll probably find that the terms and the principles are fairly similar. Okay? So, what normally happens? You are looking for uh, to raise a round, okay? You typically send your deck. You uh, have uh, been invited to present your pitch. Uh, VC falls in love with you. The investor falls in love with you. Uh, they're ready to move forward. Uh, they typically send you a document that's called the term sheet. Now, what's a term sheet? Uh, a term sheet is essentially a document that uh, summarizes the principal terms and conditions uh, that the investor would like to, uh, um, upon which the investor would like to invest in your company, right? So the term sheet would have all their terms and conditions, okay? And uh, they typically talk about preference shares. And when you open it, you'll see terms that are, you know, for example, preferential dividend on an as if converted basis a 1x liquidation preference, conversion rights, and the average weighted anti-dilution formula. Now, the first time I saw a term sheet, I was like, what is going on? Okay, so today we're going to do a bit of a deep dive into some of these commonly used terms, okay, um, uh, in the next few minutes, all right? Now, you notice in my slide, I say, well, these are the common terms that investors would ask for. Uh, and I also say, well, ask because these rights of the shares are not mandated by law. In order to understand the implication of that, we'll do first, our first point will be to understand what are preference shares. Okay? Now, as the term itself denotes, uh, it is a type of share that a company issues and it implies that there is some preferential right, some preference, some type of priority. Priority over whom? Ordinary shareholders. So what your investor is essentially asking you for, right, uh, is to give them rights that are in some ways better than the ordinary shareholder. Okay? Now, the... You know, if you only had one takeaway from today's session, it would be this. Because the, uh, the preference share is essentially a type of share that the company can define the rights to. But when you issue preference shares, the company can determine what rights attach to these shares, what rights holders of these shares enjoy. So what is the implication of that? The implication of that is that these rights are negotiable. So as a founder, as an entrepreneur, I think it's very important for you to note that these rights are, in fact, negotiable. Now, the, the investor may tell you, well, certain points are not negotiable because, for example, they have an obligation to their investors. Now, that's their commercial uh, imperative, right? That's their commercial non-negotiable. But legally, these rights are something that the company will... Uh, give to these shares when they are issued. So please bear that in mind. It's sometimes called a hybrid between um, ordinary shares and loans. Okay, and why do we say that? Because typically the investors will ask for rights that an ordinary shareholder has. Not only that, uh, they might ask for certain types of rights that are more commonly associated with loans, such as a preferential dividend, for example. Okay? So, that's point number one, that the rights to these shares are determined by the company. 
and therefore negotiable. Okay. Next, preferential dividend rights. Now, um, I have uh, in the slide an example of the, the clause that you might see in the term sheet. Here's an example. It says, the shares will have a priority or for an annual dividend equivalent to 5% of the amount prescribed for the shares. Now, so you can see here the similarities with loans. What the investor is asking for is a priority to an annual dividend, an interest rate, or on the amount subscribed for the shares, which really means the amount of money the investor has invested in your company. Okay? So this is um, you know, uh, fairly common right? when you have uh, preference shares issued. Now, this clause uh, goes on to say, uh, which will compound until paid, the dividend will compound until paid, and will also participate pro rata in any further dividend paid on the ordinary shares on an as-if converted basis. What is this trying to say? Now, the implication of this is, let's say you have uh, $1,000 to um, issue to your shareholders as dividend, to distribute as dividend, okay? What this, uh, what this right essentially says is that if your dividend is not enough to pay off the 5% to the preference shareholders, then you won't have enough to pay the ordinary shareholders because the preference shareholders have a priority, okay? So if you want to uh, declare a dividend, you have to make sure that you have enough money to pay your preferential shareholders as well as your ordinary shareholders. All right, if the money is not sufficient, then only the preference shareholders get paid the dividend, okay? which is essentially uh, the impact, the effect uh, of this type um, of provision. Okay? So what does pro rata mean? Pro rata is a term that you find very commonly in term sheets. Pro rata simply means on a... On a proportional basis, right? So if um, the preference shareholder uh, can convert their shares into ordinary shares, and we'll talk about conversion a little bit later, and if it's converted, the, the, the preference shareholder owns, say, 20% uh, of the equity in the company, a pro rata basis simply means that in this instance, the preference shareholder not only gets the 5%, but also gets to enjoy of, um, the 20% the of the balance of the money available for dividends. So in a sense, you can see that this uh, investor is asking for two bites of the cherry. Right? He gets his 5% and he also gets to participate in uh, the dividends available to the ordinary shareholders. Okay? Now, it talks about on an as-if converted basis. We'll talk about conversion rights later. But what this essentially means is that these preference shares that we are talking about in this example can be, under circumstances, converted into ordinary shares. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit later more about conversion. Okay? So clearly, this is an investor who wants to protect the return on his investment. Uh, he wants some guarantees of the return and preference uh, over the dividends, if any, are available uh, for distribution to shareholders. Now, under Singapore law, and uh, this is quite common in, in many jurisdictions, dividends cannot be paid uh, unless there are profits of the company available for payment of dividends. Right? So, as I mentioned just now, the impact of the provision in the example would be that if the company wished to pay dividends to ordinary shareholders, it was make sure that it first has enough money to pay dividends um, to the preference shareholders. Okay? So, that's the preferential dividend right. Then we move on to our third point, which is the uh, liquidation preference or liquidity preference. Okay, now this is the one that I absolutely hate reading in term sheets. It's wordy, it's complex, uh, and here you have uh, essentially a summarized version of uh, what appears in a lot of term sheets. So, it's wordy, right? Uh, it says, 
in the event of any liquidation or winding up of the company, the proceeds of the liquidation or winding up shall be paid as follows. First, one time, or it could be two times or three times, the subscription price plus any declared and unpaid dividends on each Series A preference share. Thereafter, the Series A preference shares participate with the ordinary shares on an as-if converted basis. So now you see again, uh, that th this addresses a scenario where, let's say the company is being sold, or its assets are being sold, and the company has been broken up or liquidated. And it, dis it talks about the distribution of the proceeds uh, in that type of scenario, uh, the, the balance of the assets. And here you see again, the investor is essentially saying, not only does he want uh, to protect his initial return, uh, of uh, his initial investment rather, but he, after he receives his initial investment, one time the subscription price, he gets to participate pro rata on any balance of the assets. So to give you an example in numbers, say your company has been sold for 10 million. And say this um, investor has put in 2 million to your company, that's his original investment amount. What well, if the company is liquidated, uh, what this says is that first he gets his original investment, which is 2 million. So company was sold for 10, that's a balance of 8 million left. What happens to the 8 million? This says the preference shareholder will participate with the ordinary shareholder on a pro rata basis, which means he gets a cut of the balance, right? A cut of the 8 million. Okay, so this is a typical liquidation preference clause. Um, it gives an investor priority and a return of what he has put in your company, and plus he gets to participate pro rata. This is called a, a participating preference. It's very common. Okay, um, if you look at the second paragraph, right, um, it says a merger or consolidation or any transaction where shareholders before the transaction control less than 75% of the voting power after uh, the transaction, and any lease, sale, transfer, or disposition of the assets of the company will be treated as a liquidation event and trigger the payment of the liquidation preference. Now, what the second paragraph is trying to cover is a situation where you know, the company's shares have been sold or the company's assets have been sold, right? Because the first one talks about, you know, the company's assets being sold and then uh, the company being liquidated, right? So what it says is it, if the assets of the company are sold or substantially all of the assets of the company are sold or the shares are sold, this investor is also asking to get first uh, the amount that he's invested in your company and then he gets to participate in the balance, right? So again, a fairly typical sort of uh, uh, liquidation preference clause, okay? Um, if you have a lot of bargaining power, you could try to negotiate with your investor to remove liquidity preference um, out of your term sheets so that everybody's on the same footing because as a majority investor, your argument as a founder, sorry, as a majority shareholder, as a founder, your argument would be you are incentivized to sell the company for as high a price as possible. Part of the reason why the second paragraph is written the way it is is also to prevent uh, circumvention of the liquidation preference clause because if it was written to say that if all the shares of the company are sold, the investor that the liquidation preference is triggered, then you know, uh, it, it, there's a possibility that uh, the company would try to engineer a sale of only a part of the company to avoid triggering the liquidation preference. So it's drafted in a way that even if you sell uh, not all the assets of the company, the liquidation preference clause will be triggered. Right? So to summarize, the impact here is that if the company is liquidated and there is not enough funds to go around to all shareholders. The preference shareholder will be paid first. Uh, in this example, uh, one time of the amount that they've put into your company. 
uh, if there is enough to go around, if there is balance, if there is excess, then the preference shareholder also gets a pro rata share of the balance. This is, of course, intended, uh, I mean, part of, part of the impact of this type of clause will be, of course, if you sell your company as high a price as possible, you will get a larger proportion of the entire sale price. Conversely, one of the impacts of this type of clause will be that if you get a low sale price, the founders or the entrepreneurs are in fact not incentivized at all to sell the company because you're not getting much of the sale proceeds. Right? So, you know, um, it's important to understand the impact so that you can negotiate this effectively with your investors. Okay, so I'll move on. To, uh, that's the liquidity preference. I'll move on to point number four. And we talked about this briefly um, just now, uh, about uh, conversion of the shares. Now, one of the rights that investors typically ask for would be the right to convert the preference share into uh, an ordinary share. Now, why would they want to do that? Now, there'll be situations where, of course, they would prefer to have an ordinary share. For example, uh, I put there an IPO. That means uh, initial public offering of the shares on a stock exchange. Typically, the shares will, that are offered uh, will be uh, ordinary shares. And that will be a situation where the investor will want to ensure that he can convert his preference shares into ordinary sh shares in order to float it um, on an exchange. So that would be one example uh, where they would want to exercise this right. Okay. Um, perhaps I should explain terminology here. Uh, if you see in this clause, it says the Series A preference shares. Now, um, the, not, the naming of the shares is really uh, a matter of convention. You can name it anything you want. You can create, companies can create different classes of shares and give it any name that you so choose. You could call it the Luke Skywalker class of shares. Right? It doesn't matter. So, but typically for initial series, um, you know, you would say this is a series A share or a series B share, which is why you hear people talking about an A round or a B round. Uh, before the A round, you might have a seed round. Before the seed round, you might have an angel round and so forth. Okay? So, it doesn't really matter. We do create separate classes of shares uh, partly because... Uh, as you have different, uh, as a company matures and you have different rounds of investors, uh, they tend to uh, ask for slightly different rights or subsequent investors, say your B round investors, may ask for better rights than their A round investors. So you end up creating separate classes of preference shares. Okay. So when, what happens is, of course, when you convert your preference share into an ordinary share, your preference share will be cancelled and uh, what you'll be left with is simply just the ordinary share. And the final point is the anti-dilution clause. The anti-dilution clause um, is very closely related to the ability of a preference shareholder to convert their preference share into an ordinary share. Okay? The anti-dilution clause serves to, or is intended to, protect the investor if uh, the company issues shares that at a lower price per share after the investor has invested in your company. So it in, it's intended to, um, you know, so imagine the investor has put in $10. He's worried that in a subsequent round, you issue shares to somebody else for $8. And he wants to be protected. Right? So the anti-dilution clause typically shifts the impact uh, of this down round, what we call down round, to um, the ordinary shareholders, the founders, okay? Typically founders and employees, right? So some common formulas include the weighted average anti-dilution clause and the full ratchet anti-dilution clause. Uh, the full ratchet anti-dilution clause is simply a situation where um, if you issue, say in my example, a subsequent share for $8, uh, what the clause will say is that if the investor has paid ten dollars, um, he now wants the right to uh, only pay uh, to effectively to, uh, be treated as if he's only paid eight dollars for his shares. Right. So in other words, the impact uh, will be that the ordinary shareholders give up more percentage of the company. Okay. So essentially, the weighted average formula takes into account 
the number of shares issued and the, and the value of the shares issued, and you'll end up with a conversion price uh, that is somewhere in between uh, what the investor has paid and what the subsequent investor will be paying. T typically, we'll have some exceptions, uh, some situations where uh, the anti-dilution is not triggered. For example, the issue of share options. So if you issue options to your employees, they could be free. So you don't want this to inevitably trigger the anti-dilution clause. Right? So, uh, so, and you certainly don't want to be, uh, end up in a situation where you give uh, investors uh, shares for free. So that's the anti-dilution cl uh, clause. So we've, we've talked about five points about the preference shares. Um, and I hope that uh, this will give you a taster, a primer of some of the terms that are commonly available in the term sheet. Any questions? So um, uh, obviously when you are going with investors, um, it's, not your, you know, it's not from your pocket, it's the pocket of someone else. So that person wants to have its money back at one point. So you will either with your company as a gaming company here, have a merge and acquisition with the bigger company or you, if you're really successful, you're gonna have an IPO or then as, inv as, as, as a company owner, you want to rebuy those share. So what is the mindset that gaming company here should have from the start when they go in that direction? Oh wow, um, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think that uh, my most successful clients tend to be the ones who have, a, from day one, a very win-win mentality, right? So, you know, they tend to ensure that their C-level or top, you know, guys get a cut of the company uh, so that everyone moves towards a sale or an or a acquisition. Uh, they also tend to be very fair with their investors. Uh, but, I, and I, you know, coincidentally, I was just discussing this prior uh, to this talk with a friend, uh, one of the key things, uh, one of the key strategies when you're raising funds um, is to uh, ensure that you have different types of investors on board as well. So what do I mean? Uh, you know, you might want to consider having strategic investors, uh, companies with uh, deep roots in your industry, whether upstream, downstream or whatever, who might also be a potential buyer in the future that increases your odds of being bought out. The other strategy is, of course, to have uh, well-known financial investors, uh, private equity, VCs, and so forth. Uh, their advantage, their Rolodex, their context will be to give you more people who have uh, uh, deep uh, financial pockets. So you, you have a variety of investors uh, to come on board. And the third category of investors you really should seek out would be um, people who are well-known in your industry uh, that, you know, whose, whose context you can also uh, leverage and take advantage of. So with strategic investors, financial investors, and well-known individuals, you should maximize your chance of an exit. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you.